and, and wait. <clears throat> and again, that turns out to be, that will be one of the great strengths of early Islam is that there is this larger body of scholars who will, who will hold a great deal of doctrinal power rather than that doctrinal power resting in somebody who is not Muhammad. Um, the whole few, next few years is an extraordinarily delicate and clever negotiation of authority and legitimacy. And it is a minor miracle, you might believe it's ordained by Allah, that, 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 that Islam survives these first few years after the death of Muhammad, that, that these negotiations are made successfully. Oh, thanks. Um, and and that, the, that the religion, the community, will not just survive but prosper. But no small part of that prospering and that success is due to al-Walid and the military arm of, of early Islam. The other thing you should notice is that there is very, that, that the culture, the, the learning, the, the writing of early Islam is extremely limited. You don't find people that you might call philosophers. There are certainly scholars, people who are respected for their learning, for their knowledge, for their memory, but we don't find books in early Islam. We don't find people writing treatises. We don't find, for example, people writing histories or doctrinaire treatises. The, the writings of early Islam, apart from the Quran, are extremely limited. There isn't a body of, of scholars and intellectuals most important, you might notice, is that there are no philosophers and scientists. The Bedouin have no interest in, and, and nobody studies or develops anything that we might call like philosophy or science. That it's just not something that they're interested in. And indeed, for the, for the next century, it's quite noticeable that as Islamic society expands as, ex as Islamic culture expands, it expands with very little or no indigenous philosophy. The early Muslims, basically Bedouin tribesmen, are literate but not learned. They are literate but not philosophical. Indeed, their greatest literature, as, uh, as you obviously would know, is, is in poetry, and uh, the feats of memorization of poetry are prodigious. There are people who memorize book-length um, um, poems, uh, which are, of course, the, the basis of histories. So there's, there's a lot of poetry and historical writing as poetry, but there isn't anything like science. There isn't any kind of development of philosophical thinking. Um, and this, can, this will continue on once with, after Abu Bakr with Umar, and I mean Umar then is caliph for a decade, and Umar will establish more and more what you might call an Islamic state actually a country with a ruler, with a bureaucracy, with an administration. I mean, it, it's not a church. It's not, it, 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 Islam, again, never, never really gains institutional structures. But under Umar, the central administration becomes richer as they raid to the north. It becomes richer and, and its power over um, the Bedouin tribes and the, and the cities of Arabia becomes greater and greater. Um, this, this will actually have quite severe problems as well because under Umar, as they raid north and as the, the, the Arabs gain more and more territory north of Arabia into Persia and, and into uh, Byzantium, as they raid north they, um, they obviously bring enormous amounts of, or gain enormous amounts of wealth. I mean, much of the purpose of this raiding is literally for, for booty, for pillage. Um, and they, and they, so they bring the wealth down. And Umar very carefully divides this wealth between a certain amount going to the central offices in Medina and Mecca, and a certain amount raiding, uh, staying with the raiding tribes. And it was that way that the raiding tribes got a large proportion of the booty that they were 
that they were pillaging, that actually was part of the mechanism of keeping them loyal because join us and, and you get a you know you, you get you get rich um, because you, you will you will be part of our raiding parties to the north. Um, so um, so but I should say but there is a lot of disquiet amongst many of the tribesmen engaged in these raids because by the time of of Umar, so within let's say five years of the death of the Prophet, um, the, the raiding parties start to occupy land and as it were the Islamic State makes that discovery that all states eventually make taxation <laughs> and they discover that they can take over land, they can occupy land and tax people and that becomes an, a way better source of income than going and stealing their gold and, and bring it, bringing it back to, to Medina. Um, it's much better just to own, take over these lands, let them do whatever they do, farm and, you know, farming and manufacturing and so on, and tax them. Um, and this taxation causes a fascinating resentment amongst the tribesmen because they see this, these taxes going down to Medina and there is a lot of protest that these taxes don't go to the tribes but go to the central office to as it were the caliphate and the administration in Medina. Now of course the the administration in Medina becomes extremely wealthy and is therefore able to provide all sorts of social services and money for the raiding parties and so on. So the wealth of Medina adds to its ability to gain loyalty from the tribesmen. So this system works very well but there is a certain amount and it will grow a certain amount of resentment on on the part of the tribesmen that they were God's warriors but they turn out to be working for a king because there is and it's easy to imagine there is a kind of or could one call it rugged individualism in Bedouin tribesmen who have virtually no form of government, virtually no laws, no constitution, no administration and now they're operating in a system where there is government and something like laws and a central administration and for many of the Bedouin this is the cause of considerable resentment that, that hang on, we're supposed to be following Muhammad not being an army of a caliph. In Islam there is for centuries a real debate and, and difficulty with the caliphate as a king. Okay, And of course the longer it is around the more a caliph looks like a king. And the original ideas of Muhammad and Abu Bakr and Umar were absolutely that the caliph is not a king. That changes with Uthman. Now Uthman of course um, comes, to, comes to the caliphate in very controversial circumstances. Um, there is a, a, a shura is called and then all the supporters of Ali are excluded from the shura and then the shura votes for Uthman. Um, many of the older aristocrats, the Quraysh aristocrats, being very happy with Uthman because he's one of them and well to what extent was Uthman really a, a, a genuine believer in Islam? I don't think we know but I think the fact that we can ask this question shows that Uthman's position is ambiguous. He, he takes over the caliphate after this rigged shura in which Ali is carefully excluded. Ali, by the way, is very resentful of this but then, as it were, behaves in a manner extremely loyally to, to, to Uthman, even though Uthman will abuse that loyalty again and again. And Uthman replaces all of the tribal leaders that were being put in all the lands that, that the Muslims had conquered, he replaces them with members of his own family. And the income that comes in from these tribal groups that are now effectively occupying forces in these new areas of, of Muslim con conquering land, the income 
as it were, goes to Uthman and his family, rather to the central offices in Medina. He usurps the financial authority of the government in Medina with his own, the, make it, making it his own personal domain. Now, the previous two caliphs, and obviously Muhammad, had not done this, but Uthman treats the caliphate like a kingship and treats the income of the caliphate like that of a kingship. <coughs> this will cause endless rebellion and endless resentment and there is effectively civil war off and on for the whole time of, of Uthman's caliphate. When Uthman dies, as you know, there is a civil war now. Well, then, well Ali is elected caliph by another shura, which is not a complete shura, um, but Ali is elected caliph, and then um, Muawiyah, who is Uthman's nephew, I think, who was governor of Damascus, claims the caliphate and then begins the first of the terrible civil wars of, of, the early, of early Islam. A civil war, I'm sure you know the story better than me, um, in which Ali and his sons eventually will be killed, um, and which the Shia-Sunni split begins, um, and the many layers of both theological and social resentment between the Shia and the Sunni begin. Um, uh, and, and the administration of the growing state in which Muawiyah usurps the, the caliphate, takes over the position of caliph, but does not move to Medina, but moves to Damascus. This is the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty, and <laughs> forgive me, but this is where things start to go wrong because he moves his caliphate to Damascus and Damascus becomes an imperial capital whereas Medina was never an imperial capital it was as it were the site of administration of Islam it really sh I really should say the church of Islam it should have turned into a you know an institutional church but but it didn't but still Medina was the center of administration of this thing, if I can't call it a religion, I don't have a name for it, so this thing, whereas in Damascus the Umayyads set up a capital, they build a palace for themselves, they build, build a ministry of finance, you know, they do all the things that a government does. The curious thing to notice here, it'll turn out to be very important, the curious thing to notice here is that when uh, Muawiyah starts to set up this Damascene Caliphate, the Caliphate in Damascus, and he sets it up just like a kingly capital. When he does that, who does he get to administer this new country, this new empire, which by now is stretching from North Africa into, into Pakistan, and very shortly into India, from Byzantium down the African coast. So, so already by the time of, of the establishment of the Umayyads, um, Islam is, is an enormous domain. Who do you get to administer that? I mean, which Bedouin and Bedouin tribes have practice and experience in administering a large country? Because when you take on a large country like that, when you stop raiding, when you have a large standing army, you know, you have to repair the bridges. You have to make sure that the water supply for towns is, is working. You have to make sure that land is irrigated. I mean, you, you're no longer a raiding party, you're now a government. And particularly moving the caliphate to Damascus, not only, as it were, abandons all the moral position you had in Medina, but it takes on a whole new status as, let's call it an imperial capital, because it is the capital of a small, well, middle-sized empire. Who do you get to run it? The Bedouin have never run anything other than tribes of perhaps a couple of hundred people. Who's gonna run your, your, your new empire? Any suggestions? 
I think um, they have to take uh, you know help uh, of the experiences of the you know, other civilizations and adjacent you know. Um, what was empires. what was Damascus when they took it over? Um, it was the capital of Greater Syria, a Roman province. But, of course, Rome has long since disappeared. So this is a capital of Greeks. Now, just think about it. I want in your mind, or even on a piece of yeah, paper... Was an old city. Yeah, I want you just to think about it for a moment. Write down in your mind, or on a piece of paper, 23 in Roman numerals. X, X, I, I, I. And then multiply it, sorry, sorry, and then below it, write down, let's say, 17. X, V, I, I. Okay? Now multiply the two numbers. Difficult. You can't. <laughs> Be because you can't, I mean, Roman numerals are useless for arithmetic. You, you can do addition and subtraction a bit, but multiplication and division you just can't do. This tells you something very interesting. First of all, it tells you that the Romans were, had no science, because if you had no arithmetic, you, either you can't do quantification, you can't do engineering, you can't do any science. But two, it tells you that the Romans hired somebody else to do their engineering, their accounting, their finance, their science. Because the Romans don't have a system of arithmetic in which to do science. So, who did the Romans hire to do their science? Who did the Romans hire to run their Ministry of Finance? Who did the Romans hire to, to, to do their engineering? Does anybody happen to know? Hmm? It's the Greeks. Um, and, you know, in any engineering project, in any ministry of the Roman Empire, you will find it being run by Greeks. Because whilst the Greeks are useless at running a country on their own because they're always squabbling if you if you have as it were a military power over the Greeks the Greeks are really good at getting stuff done because they have a language but above all they have the arithmetic necessary for infrastructure so the Ministry of Finance the tax system of the Roman Empire from the end of the Republic is staffed by Greeks and the, the army has a huge phalanx of Greeks in it, not to engage in war, but to do all the engineering and military technology that an army needs. And this is repeat, repeated everywhere in the Roman Empire. And Damascus was a large and successful capital because there were a bunch of Latin Romans who were running the province of, of Greater Syria, and underneath them was a large, very successful Greek bureaucracy. So when Moawiyah, when the Arabs conquer um, um, Damascus, they take over this Greek administration, and one of the reasons why Moawiyah can run the civil war and the armies that he runs is that he has a bunch of brilliant Greek administrators. Because, let's be rude, the Bedouin couldn't organize anything. They just have no culture of government administration and logistics. They never needed it, so why would they develop it? They have literacy, but they basically don't write. So there's, there's none of the necessary skills to run an empire. But you don't, why worry? I have got all of these Greeks. We just, as we defeated their armies. I will just continue to hire them. I will hire them to continue on doing the work they were doing before. Only now they're doing it under Muslim rule rather than under Roman rule. And this works. This works fabulously. As it were, the Greeks may be the worst people to have running things at the top, but if you want an administration in the ancient world that's really good, hire the Greeks, because they are really good at running an empire. They ran the Roman Empire, East and West, and they're now going to start to run the Muslim Empire. And in fact, we, get, we find complaints of one Arab warlord writing to another Arab warlord, warlord saying, 
why, why is it all the invoices and the checks and the memos and, and all the paperwork that comes out of Damascus, it's all written in Greek. Why isn't it written in Arabic? Because, of course, it's Greek writing, Greeks writing to Greek administrators to, in the various parts of the, of the empire, and they're all writing in Greek because that's the language of the administrators of the empire. This actually leads to a lovely moment in 705 when the caliph at that point kicks all the Greeks out of the administration. He just says, nope, we're only going to have Arabs running this Arab, em em uh, this Arab empire. So all the Greeks get fired and Arabs get, get hired in to run, run the empire. And the irony is so we're two weeks later, when no bills have been paid, no, no checks have been written, nobody's done anything, then it turns out they needed the Arabs to run the show. They, sorry, they needed the Greeks to run the show, and they were all rehired. So Damascus remains a Greek city with this small group of Arabs running as were well, the empire, the, this, the small group of the, the Umayyad family, who are increasingly detached from Medina and Mecca, and increasingly detached from, shall we say, the lifeblood of the Bedouin and the faithful. They instigate a policy in which other religions are, are completely tolerated. The only difference is if you're not Islamic, you pay higher taxes. That's a clever tool because, of course, it encourages people to convert until too many people convert to Islam. And then the Umayyads withdraw this advantage to people converting to Islam. Your taxes don't go down, which, of course, causes even more resentment amongst the people who convert to Islam. Uh, over the next century, I mean, over many, many decades, the people who convert to Islam then don't get the tax benefit. They're still taxed as if they weren't Muslims. So you've got resentment from, one, from the, the tribesmen that taxes are going down to Medina or staying in Damascus, not going to themselves, and you get resentment amongst the converted that their taxes don't go down. So the Umayyad dynasty is rife with civil wars, minor civil wars, big civil wars, there is a point at which, I don't know if this is part of the Muslim history you're told, but there is a point, a point when Umar, uh, sorry, sorry uh, um, Muawiyah, no, it's, it's not him, it's one of the later caliphs, sends an army down to capture Mecca and Medina, and he bombards the, the, the Kaaba with, with, I mean, bombards it with stones and destroys it. So the caliph, actually destroys the most important monument of Islam. Um, guess what? There's a lot of resentment. And there's a lot of resentment particularly because the Umayyads have become so detached from the body politic of the Arabs. By 750, 740s in fact, the civil wars under the Umayyads become pretty much continuous. There is no point for like two decades where there isn't some province in revolt or some army trying to usurp power from somebody somewhere. There is, there is continuous civil war. Although under the Umayyads, that is to say under the Greeks, the empire has continued to expand because they know how to run an army. They know how to get the logistics of an army sorted. So the empire continues to expand and it continues to expand using the, the original, the brilliant ideas, military ideas of al-Walid. So it's, as a way, innovative in, in its military terms. So it's the most effective fighting force in the world. But at the same time that it's having all of this, this success, there are continuous civil wars. These civil wars kind of come to a head in about 750. And again, I know you know all of this story of how there's then a general conflagration of civil wars. And this is where a group of warlords from, the, from, from north of the, uh, what do we call it, the Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and that area, so as it were, from Russia, a group of Central Asia, a group of, of warlords, of Muslim warlords from Central Asia gang up together 
and find some distant descendant of, of, of one of Muhammad's cousins or uncles or something and puts him um, uh, 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 at the head of this alliance and with a little bit of work and an awful lot of bloodshed they um, destroy the other parties and finally win the civil war. And this new alliance which will become the Abbasid dynasty, this new alliance um, wins the civil war and now faces a really interesting problem. Where are you going to govern from? They could go back to Medina, but that's a long way from the expanding world of Islam, because that's in the middle of you know, Arabia with no communications and long times to move to get anywhere. It's not, it's Medina and Mecca are not convenient places to run anything except Medina and Mecca. Administratively, these are not the right places to be. So, do you go back to do you go back to Damascus? Well, you know, everybody resents the fact that, that Damascus was running the empire through a bunch of Greeks. So, this is where they choose a place not far from, but not at the old Persian capital of Ctesiphon, which is, of course, Baghdad. The main reason why Baghdad is founded, is created, is because the Central Asian armies had, the, the thing that had swung the civil war was when the Central Asian armies were joined by the, Persian, the, by the Persians. And that then made them more powerful than any, any other grouping. And that's why they won the war. So it was a perfectly natural place and per perfectly natural for them to set up their capital near to Persia, near to the old Persian capital. But notice they don't set up their capital in Persia. They don't set up their capital in Ctesiphon. They move about 50 kilometers, whatever it is, from Ctesiphon to a new town. To make, to make a, a new town. <clears throat> okay, that sounds good. Let's, this is a, a good place, it's a good place to build a city. There's water, it's, it's, there's lots of traffic through that area of Baghdad. So you can move the roads so that everybody goes via Baghdad. There's the north-south routes of the Tigris-Euphrates, there's the east-west roads of the Silk Route and things like that that are all going through that area. So it's a good place to build a city. Um, but you built this city now, and who are you going to get to run the, mini the, the Ministry of Bridge Repairs? Who are you going to make sure that the post is delivered? Who are you going to make sure that the dams are fixed, and that food is distributed around the Muslim world? And, 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 and. You need an administration to run an empire. You know, just as they say um, armies march on their stomach, well, empires march on a, an efficient administration. And what have you got in Baghdad by way of an efficient administration? Anyone care to suggest who to hire? Anybody? Who is to run the administration in Baghdad? Abbasid Sorry? Abbasid dynasty. Abbasid dynasty. But he's asking who is who is to run the administration? Who are where are the experts that manage all this? I mean, you you know, it, this is this is a big empire. Wow. It's rich, and there's a lot of infrastructure. And above all, of course, the Arabs know the thing that matters most is infrastructure for transport, transport of armies, transport of goods, transport of taxes. So they know that the bigger the empire is, the better the infrastructure has to be. So you have to have industrial, political, and, and economic infrastructure. And it's, it's big. I don't have an idea because I'm not a historian, but I suppose they have developed themselves uh, no. because it was uh, no. neat. This is, I mean, the, the, I, I re, re, remember the Arabs, the Arabs in this story are basically Bedouin. And the Bedouin have no history of administration. They have no history of law, philosophy, constitutions, bureaucracy, none. Because in a Bedouin tribe of 200, oh, you, you don't need that. What about the no, that's going to that's going to come. That has to be built. That has to be built. 
Okay, so it wasn't it wasn't there before Baghdad was founded, right? So what are the Greek experts? They well, they're all in Damascus. Damascus. They're in Damascus. Damascus. And hang on, if you hire all the Greeks and take them out to Baghdad, wouldn't you reckon you're going to have resentment once again that it's the bloody Greeks who are pagans, Christians, who are running our Muslim empire? And that caused resentment in, in Damascus. It's going to cause resentment if you bus, if you hire, you know, fill a hundred buses full of Greek administrators and bus them out to, to, to Baghdad. That's not going to work because once again, the memos, the checks, the invoices, all the, the bureaucracy will be done in Greek. Well, the answer is staring you in the face, but you don't think of it because. <clears throat> Just next door, we've had a Persian Empire for the last 2,000 years. Indeed, it's probably one of the earliest ever empires, and the Persian Empire has a long tradition of really brilliant statecraft. They know how to keep transport infrastructure going. They know how to get food from A to B. They know how to, how, how to tax how to, how to tax things, collect taxes. They know how to move armies over long distances. So all you've got to go do is go and hire Persian families, Persian aristocrats who... Cyrus. Sorry? Cyrus the Great. No, okay, that's not relevant. That's, Sirius is, is 800 years earlier, 900 years earlier. Okay, so that, that's not that's not what we're talking about. So we've got a vast number. I mean, Persians, and we've got families of aristocrats who have been in the court of the of the Persian, the royal Persian court, for generations, serving as ministers, bureaucrats, administrators, and so on. These people haven't died. They're still they're still around. They just. You know, they, they just become local warlords, local governors, and so on. There is a huge literature in Persian on statecraft. And as it were, <coughs> you could translate it into Arabic, and then it becomes Arab statecraft. And st Arab texts on how to maintain the bridges, and how to maintain the postal service, and da 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 da. So the caliphate, and here is the stroke of genius, the Abbasid Caliphate realizes that they need the Persians to run their empire, but they will oblige the Persians to do it in Arabic. It is not clear how many of the Persians had converted to Islam at this point. It's probably quite a small percentage, but they kept their Zoroastrianism, as it were, at home and they would have a fire temple at home, but in public they took on Arabic names and would go to the mosque on Friday and do their appropriate prayers and, and pr appropriate as well rituals as Muslims in public, but maintaining private Zoroastrian beliefs. This is what normally happens when people convert. Conversion is a misnomer. Very, very rarely in history do people actually convert. What they do is they compromise the two religions, and they believe in both. And four generations later, they have shifted. But it's very, very rare to find you know, 50 men who on Monday are religion A and Wednesday are religion B. That very, very rarely happens. Especially for the first generation. Uh, but, I mean, going from pagan to Christian is the same thing. Going from pagan to Muslim, it's the same thing. It's everywhere where you get religions changing. What happens is there is a long period of mess where people appear to be one or the other or both, and you can't really tell what's true. And it's quite clear that much of the Persian world although they'd been conquered by the Arabs a hundred years before, they had not converted, but they were perfectly comfortable with this kind of schizophrenia of public Islam, private Zoroastrianism. And of course, the Muslims were not stupid administrators. They let this be. They didn't, Islam has hardly ever converted by the sword, despite what Western people say. 
there are I mean there are only the, the tiniest examples of conversion through violence. Islam has always said, well, you know, come and join us if you wish to. If you don't, you pay higher taxes, but it's up to you. I mean, you know, you're, you've got your religion, I've got mine. Um, early Islam is particularly extraordinarily, well, Islam has always been extremely tolerant. And until, you know, a couple of particular groups very recently have been less tolerant, but that's not mainstream Islam. Mainstream Islam has always been very tolerant, and Persia is the perfect example of this early tolerance, is that Persia was probably still basically Zoroastrian, but was behaving in a Muslim manner. And the, and the Abbasid Caliphate <clears throat> simply sets up a new administration and begins a vast translation exercise of all of those books on statecraft in Persian, translating them into Arabic. This is not the Houses of Wisdom. The Houses of Wisdom are a myth. They don't exist. Okay? They didn't happen. Um, so there is this first, and the point is, it's the first things that get translated, are these hundreds and hundreds of volumes on Persian volumes on statecraft, which get turned into Arabic and then get disseminated throughout the Muslim world. The genius here of the Abbasids is that they recognize that if they make the Abbasid Caliphate look like it's like Damascus, in other words, run by the Greeks, they will have civil war on their hands tomorrow. If they let it look like the Abbasid Caliphate is being run by the Persian aristocracy, footnote, which it was, but if this is, what, if this is how things appear in public, there will be civil war tomorrow morning. Because the one thing that everybody except for the Persians would agree to was that we're not having the Persian Empire recreated. So that everybody has agreed to that. And what the Abbasid Caliphate looks like, and in fact it is, is the Persian Empire recreated. But the Caliphate, the Abbasids, are clever enough not to let it look that way because they put it all into Arabic. And you've got one Persian a bureaucrat writing a memo to another Persian bureaucrat and it's got to be in Arabic. And it's that enforcement of the quote Arabization of the bureaucracy which means that, that um, Baghdad is not only a brilliantly efficient capital because it's got all of these Persians who know how to run a state but it doesn't get the hostility and the aggravation of everybody who isn't a Persian. But at the same time, don't forget, you've got to placate the Persians. So the Abbasid Caliphate is, is being running a very clever, subtle political game of not looking too Persian to the non-Persians, but looking Persian enough to the Persians that nobody's going to start a civil war. It's a tightrope and they manage it. And it's brilliant. It's just gobsmacking. The, 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 the early Abbasid caliphs, there's, a, there's half a dozen of them, who are as clever as can be, one after another, and have really clever ministers and advisors who keep them, who understand the difficulty of the position of running the Muslim world, and keep it on this very clever knife edge. Because you look too Persian, civil war. You look too not Persian enough, civil war. So everything goes into Arabic. Once, as it, in oh, finish in five minutes. Okay. So once things go into Arabic, of course, then the caliphate starts. Okay, we can't recreate the Persian Empire. So we're going to have to do something more. We're going to have to do things different from the Persian Empire. For example. What form of arithmetic are we going to use? Well, they look around the Muslim world and they literally look around to pick up who has the best commercial arithmetic. Does anyone know in the, in the 8th century who has the best commercial arithmetic? In, as it were, the Central, Central Asia? Yeah, you, you do actually know because it's the Hindus. 
So Hindu arithmetic becomes the arithmetic used throughout the Muslim world. And you use it today as what is called Hindu Arabic arithmetic, but it has nothing to do with the Arabs. It is Hindu Muslim arithmetic. They look all around the world, the Muslim world, and they pick the best of everything all around the world. Who has the most sophisticated agriculture? It's the Hindus. So Hindu ar agriculture becomes used throughout the Muslim world. What's important with hi Hindu agriculture is the, is the Hindus use what we would today call proteinaceous legumes. In other words, you get your protein from vegetables, not animals. And that's way more efficient. You get more protein per square meter if you grow proteinaceous vegetables than if you grow grain which you feed to animals. So there's an agricultural revolution through the Muslim world because they introduce Hindu um, agriculture. One of the things the Persians are most fixated with is astrology. I mean, they're absolutely fixated with astrology. So one of the things the Abbasid Caliphate says to the Persians is this new Muslim Caliphate will make your astrology even better. It'll be as good as it ever was, it'll be better than it ever was. Because we will give you the best astronomy on which to base your astrology. Greek astronomy. So Greek astronomy starts to become the foundation of Persian astrology. And the Persians love it. But of course, if you're going to do Greek astronomy, you need Greek geometry which means you need to buy into Greek geometry. They love Greek medicine. It turns out Greek medicine is one of the most sophisticated medical doctrines in the Middle East, so they buy into Greek medicine. So astronomy, mathematics, and medicine hmm, are bought in from the Greeks and spread throughout the Muslim world translating these works from Greek or whatever into Arabic. It's not the house of wisdom. There are many libraries in Baghdad where these translations are occurring and they get called the houses of wisdom, plural, not singular. And the houses of wisdom are just libraries where scholars translate from anything into Arabic and then begin to disseminate these Arabic works. But the genius is they don't just disseminate Euclid, they disseminate a textbook with it, they disseminate a textbook called Euclid for Dummies, or an introduction to Euclid, or everything you ever wanted to know about geometry. In other words, they turn them into teaching texts. That will be significant in a little while in the north of Spain, because there'll be all of those teaching textbooks on Aristotle. In order to try, my, this is my, my, my final point, in order to try and convert the many religions of the Muslim world to Islam, the Caliphate, by about 760, 765, the Caliphate begins what it calls a conversation amongst the religions, which was supposed to be, was, an argument where tolerance was required between various religions. And there survive literally tens of thousands of texts, which are the report of an argument between a Zoroastrian and a Jew, a Muslim and a Christian, a Christian and a Zoroastrian, a Baha'i and a... Every imaginable religion in the, in the Muslim world was supposed to argue with every other religion. And this was, this was actually fed and supported by the Caliphate. The irony, however, is there were many Christians in Persia at this time, because they had fled from Byzantium many generations earlier. There were many Christians, and every time these arguments were held, the Christians won. I mean, if it was a Jew versus um, a Zoroastrian, you didn't know how it was going to turn out. If it was a Muslim versus a Zoroastrian, you didn't know how it was going to turn out. If it was a Christian versus anything, the Christians always won. 
and we have time and time again we've got these the, the reports of these arguments where it has to be agreed that the Christians got the better of the argument and this is where the Muslim scholars realized the Christians were better at argument because they knew Aristotle so the Caliph as it were, in words of one symbol, says to the Islamic scholars in Baghdad, not in Medina, but in Baghdad, he says to the, he says to the Islamic scholars, you need to read Aristotle and you need to turn Islam into an Aristotelian religion. Because clearly the Christians can beat everybody with their arguments, so we need to do better. So this leads to the importation of Aristotle into the Muslim world and the beginnings of Muslim rationalism. The irony here is one of the tools that they will use Aristotle for is to shift Islamic philosophy, and Islamic thinking, one, to justify the caliph as a king and two, to justify Islam as an international universal religion in which the Arabs have no special role. And this is the point between 760 and 800 when the, the Abbasids deliberately marginalize the Arabs. And the Arabs are removed from the history of Islam. And they will never again be politically important. Okay. I don't think. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Any question, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, to your account of uh, what you concluded that Arabs were excluded from the whole scenario, if this is the picture, how can we say this civilization, especially this Abbasid civilization, as an Islamic civilization? Well, its religion is completely Islamic and the central policy of the Abbasids is one to slowly, gently convert everybody to Islam. So the core of it is Islamic. What about, you, sorry, shortly, uh, what about your opinion uh, that is claimed that Al-Ghazali has stopped uh, the exercise of rationality and, you know, oppose all this philosophy because he has written the book, uh, The Reputation of Philosophy. But we see that he was not a philosopher, but he argued very philosophically against, you know, Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi. Yeah. Um, so what about the claim that, uh, 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 the blame, actually, the accusation that uh, it is Al-Ghazali who has stopped rationalism and the Mutazilites in the Arabic uh, world, in the Baghdad specifically. Because there is now going to be, I mean, when you have a central... He was, he was himself not an Arab. When you, when you have a central, um, a central, philosoph central state with a central philosophical doctrine, guess what, you're going to get opposition. And the prime opposition will, become, will come from mysticism of Medina and Mecca. That will be the prime opposition, eventually the Sufis. But you the role of Ghazali? Sorry? What is the role of Ghazali? Is well, he's, he's, he is ultimately opposed to the central doctrines of, and the statecraft of Baghdad. I mean, he's, he's, he's not mainstream. Um, and, and he will be in opposition to that. Um, um, but, but, but that's inevitable when you have a centralized state and a centralized, and, and there is a philosophical doctrine that stems from that centralized state. The first thing every other philosopher is going to do is disagree. So, whereas before you had many different views and schools, when you have one school, kind of monolithic, which becomes Aristotelian, rationalist, and dictatorial, because it's supporting a kingly caliph, so then you get an opposition which is hostile to the dictatorship of the caliphate, hostile to the so autocracy. Hostile to the specific person yeah. or the system, not the whole exercise of, you know, science, philosophy. Yeah, no, yes, but, but that, that, why do you think it's difficult? Why do you think it's unusual for philosophers to disagree? Yeah. That's what it is. And that's going to be starker, that's going to be more visible when you have a central so authority. Blaming Al Ghazali specifically to stop the rationality or the. Not in the least, I never said that. 
I never said that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I, I never said that. Um, I, but he is one of the the shall we say opponents to this centralized state. Yeah, but he has contributed by writing books philosophically. But do you, is he, is he, are you saying he's the only philosopher in no, Islam? No. no, so we have, let's say, a thousand philosophers. Al-Ghazali is philosopher number 722. What about the other 999? Many hundreds of them are in support of the central doctrines of the central state, and many of the others will not be in support. Do, do you know of the, of the late 8th century controversy about the co-eternality of the Quran. And, I mean, philosophers will get executed because this is one of the grounds in which the central state will try to enforce philosoph philosophical hegemony. Uh, if you don't believe that the Quran is co-eternal with God, you'll get executed. And, you know, and so there are many who oppose this. You got interest in you know, the history and philosophy and Islam, I see. What is it about? I don't expect it from a philosophy, a mathematics professor. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll explain very simply. Um, um, I, I, um, Al Khorizmi did not invent algebra. This, the story you've been told about the invention of algebra is all wrong. And I will give you your next lecture on the, the real story of algebra. Okay, so there's a long story. It has nothing to do with al This is more school myths. So that got me interested in, because it was probably Nishapur Buddhists who first did something that I want to call algebra. This was then, in the 6th century, taken up by Persians. Of course, al Khorizmi is a Persian in, in Central Asia, of Persian descent in Central Asia. So, not <coughs> Indians. Not Indians, no. I hate to say it. It is, I'm afraid, the Persian. The Indians want, there's a Hindu nationalist, there's Hindu nationalist historiography these days that claims everything was invented by the Hindus. Rocket science, quantum mechanics, <laughs> you know, everything. So, I'm afraid it, Hindu scholarship is going through a difficult period because it's now. getting tainted now, today, I mean, these, these last decade. It's getting tainted and it's, it's not clear. So you have to take a lot of that with a grain of salt. But, um, but so I got interested in Persia and early Islam. Then there was the atrocity of 9-11 and I decided to make my small contribution to world peace that I would teach a course on early Islam. One of the oddities about Cambridge, because we're a medieval university, I have, I have to teach what I'm contracted to teach, which is you know, mathematics. mathematics, which I've been doing, um, but I'm allowed to teach anything else I want, and the university can't say no. I'm allowed, I mean, literally, as long as it's not illegal, I can teach anything I want. And so I decided I would give a course on early Islam. And that way, at least 40 or 50 students come out of the science faculty of Cambridge each year who know about the history of Islam. And I tell everybody who comes, you leave your personal religion at the door. Okay, we're here as scholars and historians. This has nothing to do with your faith. So I've you're doing this from, uh, from so many years? Yeah, and, and, I, and I've, I've, every year I have several Arab or Muslim kids who take my course, and I am very pleased to see. Let me let me finish. Let me finish. I've had these students take my course, and quite frequently they have come up to me at the end of the course, and to say not only it was good, I was they they didn't mind that I took a different view. I was very respectful and so on. But I've had several of them say, "You've made me a better Muslim." <laughs> so you're making better Muslims. <laughs> But you are a teacher, I suppose. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. This is a personal question. Just I want to know. Have you said the Holy Quran fully? You said the Holy Quran in Arabic. Have you read the Quran? You said the. I I have read large chunks of the Quran in English. I do not I do not read Arabic. I do not read Arabic. So, Professor, you are a Christian by religion, personal. Um, I'm going to be very difficult and say, you don't need to know my religion. I should be able to talk about Islam as a historian, as a scholar, without, without my religion appearing. And it's important for me that I can talk, and I talk about Christians in the 16th century, without you knowing my religion. As it were, 
it, it shouldn't be there because that's okay, that's okay. you know that's, that's, we, that's, we should have respect that's, for that's each okay. other's faiths. One, one question, please. Never yeah. mind, please. You told that Islam, Islam is an Arabic religion. What do you mean? Sorry, I, I, you told that uh, the, in your Laksar, you told that is, Islam is an Arabic religion. What do you mean by Arabic religion? Are you, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. You, did you ask that I am saying that Islam is an Arabic religion? Arabic. Well, in its origin it is, because the Prophet Muhammad was an Arab and his followers were Arabs, and it grew up... The emergence from, and the original origin, origin of the, the you know, the locality. Sorry, I didn't understand a word of that. Say, say it slowly. So the emergence of Islam, the yeah. locality of Islam is that... Is, it, is Arabic. Arabic. I mean, that, that, in that sense. There's no question. And the, 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 it is written in, in Arabic. So it is a religion whose origin is in Arabic. Yeah. Arabic. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing to talk about here. That's, that's a historical fact. Now, now you want to, you're going to have to ask a different question, which is how did it lay claim to be a universal religion, yeah, yeah, yeah. not a religion yeah. of, of the Arabs. That is what the Baghdad Caliphate does when they learn about Aristotle. They use that to produce this new universal ideology of Islam, which is rationalist and which marginalizes the Arabs. That's what the Baghdad Caliphate does. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you.